Today we are looking at how to avoid racking up hidden tax liabilities that could cost your business. And we are covering therefore VAT and tax on fringe benefits. So our host for today's webinar and the technician for today's webinar is our professional webinar guru Shane Webb, who is based in Howick in KZN. And I'd like to kick off by introducing our presenter, Madeleine Pretorius. Madeleine is a band franchise owner based in Paul in the Western Cape, and together with myself, heads up technical training with the band franchise group. Now, Madeleine uh, qualified as a chartered accountant um, in 2012 after completing her psycho articles at Pricewaterhouse Accounting in 2011. And she's a registered CA with the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants. So just a little housekeeping before we get started. We would love to hear from you. If you have any questions presentation, please type them into the question box in your control panel on the right side of your screen. Questions for the panel who will assist will consist of both myself and Madeleine at any time during the presentation, which we will then address at the end of this webinar. Our last month's recorded webinar was on business financial analysis using management accounts for critical business strategy and initiative planning. That has been loaded and is available for viewing on our website at www.band.co.za under the events page. Click on complimentary business webinars for last month and you can view that particular webinar. Copy of today's webinar, please email BAN's head office at info at ban.co.za and we shall I email you a recording, otherwise we will also load this later on onto our website. So this is Monique Charlin saying goodbye. Hear your questions later on. And now with you, we will cross over to our presenter today, Madeleine. Good morning, Madeleine. Good morning, Monique. Thank you for that lovely. Um, thanks to all our listeners for joining us today. Welcome to our webinar session. Um, and thanks, Shane, for your technical assistance as always. Today's topic uh, deals with the tax and VAT implications on fringe benefits. Um, this is, could quite, get quite a technical topic. So what we're doing today is really just to provide you as business owners an overview and understanding of the fringe benefits and an awareness really of the different type of fringe benefits that you can get and what the tax and VAT, VAT implications will be on those. We won't be going into too much technical detail, especially on the calculations of the values of fringe benefits. I would highly recommend that you involve your accountant when you do deal with fringe benefits, especially on the calculations and making sure that you do submit and declare all the fringe benefits that you need to. For those of you who are not familiar with the term fringe benefit, a fringe benefit is any benefit or additional compensation that an employee receives over and above their normal cash salary. It's usually used by employers from a recruiting point of view to entice talent to their company, but it isn't necessarily always a recruiting tool. It could also be just to assist employees in your company or in your CC. Now, this fringe benefit or these fringe benefits are usually added to your employee's remuneration package and taxed. And just remember that when an employee, in the slide a bit later on, it also specifically includes any directors of companies or members of a CC who are involved in the side of that CC. Now these fringe benefits are then added to your package and ultimately form part of the overall compensation received by that employee. And some examples could be um, a company car that you receive or paid holidays that you give to your employees. Now the Tax Act, the Income Tax Act and the Tax Administration Act places some obligations upon the employer. If you are a um, owner managed business, so you are a director, the sole director and shareholder of a company or the sole member of a CC, you might think to yourself, mm, well, I'm not really an employer because I don't have any employees in my business. It's just me. What do these obligations have any? Well, you'll see from our um, from the definitions in the Income Tax Act and the Tax Admin Act that we'll look at it in the next slide. An employee is specifically stated to be a director as well. And if you are an owner-managed business, you would obviously be running your CC, so you would be based 
uh, you would be operationally involved in that CC. So you would be deemed to be an employee as well. So even if you're owner managed, you are still required to meet these obligations as an employer because you yourself are being, you, you are being deemed to be an employee as well. Now, what are these obligations? First of all, the employer must determine the cash value of the fringe benefit received by the employee. The employer must then add that cash value to the employee's remuneration for purposes of PAYE or employee's tax, as well as the annual tax return of that employee. And on an annual basis, the employer must then issue that employee with an RP5 or IT3A certificate. And on that certificate, you need to clearly state the nature and cash value of the fringe benefit. So you need to use the correct income tax code for that. Here again, I would recommend you use the assistance of your accountant to make sure that when you're determining the cash value of the fringe benefits and you're disclosing them on your IRP5 certificates that you are doing this correctly because it can get quite technical. So please use your accountant's assistance for that. Who will be affected by fringe benefits? All employees who receive compensation or benefits above their normal salary package. So if a fringe benefit is applicable to an employee, it will affect their income tax and it will also affect the obligations of the employer. Now, an employee in terms of the Tax Act is any person who receives remuneration or who, to whom remuneration accrues. And this specifically includes, as I mentioned before, a director of a company or any member of a CC acting in a managerial position. Once again, if you're an owner managed business, that will be you yourself. You would still need to comply with these um, requirements. An interesting thing to note also, and just to be aware of is, in all the slides today, I'm going to be talking about the employer-employee relationship with regards to fringe benefits. But please be aware that if the employer has any benefit to a relative of an employee, whether it is a spouse, a child, they might be giving a bursary to one of the children of the employees, if any of the relatives of the employee also receive a benefit, that will be deemed to be a fringe benefit on, from the point of view of the, the employee. So please be aware of that because it's not necessarily just the employee that would receive the benefit. Let's have a look at the different types of fringe benefits that are, are applicable in terms of the seventh schedule of the Income Tax Act. First of all, the acquisition of an asset at less than market value. So a fringe benefit will arise if any asset is acquired by an employee for no consideration or a consideration that is less than the value of that asset. And it specifically says that it could be any goods, commodity, financial instruments, or property of any nature, other than money, of course, because that is a cash transfer and would normally be subject to your normal PAYE rules. Examples of these could include, for example, gift vouchers that you give to your employees, or it could be a promotion or an incentive that you are running or your company, whereby you are getting prizes for certain performance of work, outstanding work. Or you could, for example, be structuring salaries in such a way that if an employee receives a bonus, instead of taking that bonus in cash, in an effort to prevent or, or kind of save, I want to say, POIE on that bonus, um, you could be structuring it in such a way that they actually receive assets or they go on holiday instead of that cash bonus. And then you might think, okay, but we, we possibly don't then declare that for PAYE, but that then becomes a fringe benefit and it will still have PAYE on it. But the value of that benefit, if it's an acquisition of an asset at less than market value, would be the market value thereof at the time that the employee acquired that asset. And PAYE is to be deducted in the month that asset was acquired. If, however, the PAYE on that asset is too big in that month to deduct, in other words, it's going to erode the employee's salary so much that they can't actually cover the expenses in that month, then you are allowed to spread it over the remainder of the tax year. Another example that I can give you would be, for example, if your company or CC is in the textile or clothing industry, you might be giving your employees vouchers to buy clothes at cost instead of at the normal selling price that would also be constituted as a fringe benefit. Then the right of use of an asset. So the employee is not receiving the asset outright, but they are allowed to use it. So the employee is granted the right of use of any asset, however, not including residential accommodation or any motor vehicle, because that is dealt with as a fringe benefit and separate, separate um, to this um, part of the, the seventh schedule. If they use that asset for private or domestic purposes, 
and it's either for free or for no con uh, for, for a consideration which is less than the value of use, then a fringe benefit will arise. Now, one of the most common examples of that could be the use of a laptop to an employee. Um, so it's a company laptop, but they use it um, for, for their own purposes, or it could be cell phones. Now, in such a case, there are certain exemptions to this right of use of an asset fringe benefit, which says, if you receive a telephone or a cell phone or a computer or a laptop, and you use it as an employee mainly for purposes of the employee's business, a fringe benefit will not arise. So if the private use is incidental to the business of the employee or the business use, then you won't have a fringe benefit on that. But then you also need to look at the circumstances and to see whether this is reasonable. Because if, for example, you are a secretary and you receive, you have a desktop computer, you work nine to five, there's no reason for you to work overtime. You can perform all your duties during office hours, but you receive right of use of a laptop. Are you really going to use that laptop for business purposes? Not really. It's probably going to be for private or domestic purposes. And in that, that case, it would definitely be a fringe benefit. Another exemption that the, um, the, the seventh schedule actually provides is if a company or CC provides certain assets in general to their employees for use recreationally at their business, that will also not be a fringe benefit. And I think a nice example of that, it might not be applicable um, in terms of our companies here in South Africa, maybe if you're a very large company, um, but a nice example that you might have either read about or heard about is um, the new offices at Google. They have a whole section that is for the recreational purposes of the employees. They can go there and they can have um, kind of like speed naps and they can play games and kind of relax as, as part of the environment. In that case, those assets as part of that recreational space will not be a fringe benefit. Now, the seventh schedule looks at three different scenarios in terms of valuing this fringe benefit of right of use. First of all, if the employer is leasing that asset, the value of the benefit would be the amount of rental payable by the employer over the period that the employee has use of that asset. If the employer owns the asset, there will be a calculation of 15% multiplied by the lower of cost or market value of the asset over the period, once again, that the employee has use of the asset. And if that employer has been granted sole access or sole use of that asset over the entire or most of the useful life of that asset, then it will be the cost to the employer. PAYE will also be payable on that. So you would take the cash equivalent benefit and you would apportion it over the period that the employee has use of that asset. So you will, you will pay PAYE on that benefit over the period that they have right of use. But if the employee is granted sole right of use of the asset, then that PAYE will accrue on the date that the um, asset was first granted to the employee. Let's look at two brief examples or quite simple examples just to illustrate the principle. The first scenario where the employer rents that asset. So the employer rents a caravan from a third party and makes it available to an employee for a holiday. The employer pays 100 rand per day for 10 days, which amounts to 1,000 rand of rent paid. So if you go and look at our previous slide in terms of the value of the benefit, if the employer is leasing that asset, the value of the fringe benefit will be the amount of rental payable by the employee over the period. So that would be 100 rand for 10 days, which is 1,000 rand. And that 1,000 rand will be subject to employee's tax over those 10 days, which would probably be in that same month. And it must be deducted from the employee's salary that month. In the second scenario, we look at where the employer owns the asset. Employer owns a caravan. He makes it available to the employee for a holiday of 10 days once again. On the date he purchased that in a caravan, he paid 60,000 Rand for it. But the market value on the date that he gave that right of use to the employee, it was only 40,000 Rand. So the calculation we look at is we say 15% multiplied by the cost. We apportion it over the period of days that the employee has right of use and we get a fringe benefit value. And we go and calculate the 15% multiplied by the market value apportioned over the right of use days, and we get another fringe benefit value. And if you go and look at, I'll go two slides back, if you go and look at the scenario where the employer owns the asset, we need to look at that value at the lesser of cost or market value. So in this in, uh, example, the lesser of cost or market value would be this scenario, which is the using the market value. So that 164 Rand would be subject to employee's tax and the employer must deduct that tax or employee's tax from the employee 
at the same intervals that the employee is, is remunerated for the relevant period of use. So it would probably be for the salary that month. The next fringe benefit we're looking at are meals, refreshments, and vouchers. And this is something quite common that we come across quite often, especially in the, um, in the, industry, uh, the um, SME market. Where an employee provides any meal or refreshment or voucher, entitling, uh, um, sorry, the employer provides that meal, refreshment or voucher, entitling the employee to any meal or refreshment free of charge or for a consideration which is less than the value of that meal, refreshment or voucher, a fringe benefit will arise. The value of that benefit is the cost to the employer less any consideration paid by the employee. And then once again, PAYE needs to be deducted from that cash equivalent. Now there are certain exemptions that the Income Tax um, Act um, offers. So for example, if you have a staff canteen or a cafeteria where you provide meals to your staff on the business premises for their general use, that will not arise as a fringe benefit. It'll only be in a case where you don't actually have a canteen and you actually give vouchers or meals to your employees for lunch, say for example. If an employee, uh, if so, sorry, for example, you have a staff party or you have a Christmas party or they, maybe someone has a birthday and you're celebrating them at, that at work, any refreshments that you provide with regards to special occasions or overtime that's being worked, those will not also be fringe benefits. And if you as an employee go and take out clients for lunch um, and you entertain them on behalf of your employer, those will also not be fringe benefits. However, once again, please look at the circumstances of the case because you need to see whether this is reasonable or not. If, for example, you're a surgeon, and you have a really large bills in terms of client lunches or client, does this really make sense? Are you as a surgeon going to wine and dine your patients either before or after surgery? Not really. So in that case, it will probably be a fringe benefit that arises. However, if you are an attorney or a similar industry where you have to take your clients out part of your business, then that would not be a fringe benefit. Let's look at a very, um, uh, uh, as I say, simple example again, just to illustrate the principle. An employer pays 20 rand a meal for employees at a dining place close to where the business is situated. He provides each employee with 20 coupons per month, for which the employee must pay 160 rand. So in other words, they get each coupon for 8 rand, so there's a discount on the amount that they have to pay. And one meal can be enjoyed, enjoyed at the dining place for each coupon. The taxable value of the benefit is then calculated as the cost to the employer, which is 400 rand, less the cost to the, uh, to the employee because they paid a contribution as well which was 160 rand so the total taxable benefit would be the 240 rand and that is the value on which the PIYE would be calculated. Then free or cheap services also quite a common fringe benefit to come across. If any service has been rendered to an employee and it's been utilized by that employee for private or domestic purpose at no consideration or considerably lower consideration and it's at the expense of the employer, a fringe benefit will arise. So in terms of valuing that benefit, we also look at two scenarios. If it's a travel facility and the company or CC is in the travel industry, it'll be the amount equal to the lowest fare payable by any passenger um, that uses that facility less any amount paid by the employee. And for any other service, it'll be the cost to the in that service or having that service rendered for the employee, less any amount that the employee might pay. And once again, PAYE is to be deducted from that fringe benefit or cash equivalent of the benefit. There are once again certain exemptions. For example, if you provide parking to your employees in terms of um, um, at their place of work, that will not be a taxable benefit. Or if you are in a specific industry, let's say the hospitality industry, and as part of your business, you arrange transport for your employees to get from their home to their place of work and back again, that will not usually be a fringe benefit either. So please have a look once again at the circumstances of your business and the case to see whether a fringe benefit will arise. And please use the assistance of your accountants. Let's have another look at an example. If an educational institution, such as a university or Technicon, provides free or cheap tuition to the children of personnel, a taxable benefit will rise. The value of that benefit will be the marginal cost involved in the tuition of that additional person. But if there's a contribution made by the employee and it's equal to or more than that marginal cost, then there won't be a taxable benefit. 
So you can always see that there's a bit of a calculation as to what is the benefit received by the employee, what does the employee contribute, and the difference would usually be the extra or additional benefit that they get, which is applicable for tax purposes. Also consider things like bursaries or scholarships that you receive from your employer, whether it's for you, your spouse, your children, a relative, that will also give rise to a fringe benefit. But then also there is an exemption in the Income Tax Act which has specific requirements with regards to bursaries and scholarships. So once again, use the assistance of your accountant to make sure that you do take into account all the tax implications. Fringe benefit we see very often is low interest or interest-free debt. So any loan or debt that is granted by the employer to the employee, and there's no interest payable on that debt, or the interest that is payable is much lower than the official rate of interest, there will be a fringe benefit. Now, the official rate of interest is a term that basically refers to an, an, an interest rate that is calculated by taking your rep, repo rate and adding 100 basis points. So, for example, if your country's repo rate or if our repo rate is, say, 7%, then the official interest rate will be 8%. So, you add 100, which is 1%. That's your official rate. And to calculate the value of the fringe benefit in this instance, you would take the amount of interest that would have been paid on that loan at the official rate of interest, less any interest that the employee would actually have paid. So if they hadn't paid anything, that would be zero. And if they did pay it, say, let's say your interest rate, your official rate is 8%, the employee paid interest at, say, 3%, then a fringe benefit would arise on that difference of the 5% that he would have had to pay if he used the official rate of interest. And this benefit is also subject to employee's tax. There are some exemptions to these staff loans. So the Income Tax Act specifically says that if any staff loan is less than 3,000 Rand, there won't be a benefit. But please be careful. It doesn't actually exclude staff loans less than 3,000 Rand just because they are less than 3,000 Rand. We're looking at small staff loans that are not granted on a regular basis. So they are very ad hoc in nature. And only then will they not be a benefit. If employer, the employer grants um, debt on a regular basis to the employees, and whether that debt is less than 3,000 Rand or not, it will still attract a fringe benefit. Interestingly, if a low interest or interest-free debt is provided to a director of a company or a member of a closed corporation, not in their capacity as an employee, in other words, not in terms of the services that they render, but in their capacity as either a shareholder or a member, then that loan would change nature somewhat. And it will not necessarily be a fringe benefit, but you'll have to go and look at the requirements with regards to shareholder loans and um, the interest rate. And then the interest on the debt owed would therefore not then be deductible by either the company or the CC. Any contributions made to retirement funds by an employer, whether it is a, a pension, a provident or retirement annuity fund, and those contributions are made on behalf of the employee, that will also give rise to a fringe benefit. The value of that benefit, we look at two scenarios. If it is a defined contribution benefit plan, or there's a defined contribution component, then the amount that is contributed by the, the, by the employer, who on behalf of that employee, that would be your benefit amount for, for purposes of fringe benefits tax. But any other components are usually determined in terms of a formula calculation that the fund usually does, and then they put it in your contribution certificate and send it to the employer. And that amount you would then put on the certificate. Then a fringe benefit that I think most of you have come across, it's quite, is right of use of a motor vehicle. So the employee is granted right of use of a motor vehicle for private or domestic purposes, either free of charge or for a consideration which is much less than the value in domestic use. Just remember that the fringe benefit in terms of the right of use of motor vehicle will only arise if that motor vehicle or company car is owned by the company itself or the CC. It must be a business vehicle. The value of the benefit is calculated by using the value of private use, which we'll, we will look at in the next few slides, less any amount paid by employee, and that will then be the value of the benefit on which employee's tax will be payable. Now, private use, if you look at private and domestic use, it does include, if you use that vehicle, between purposes of, for purposes of traveling between your home and place of work, that is considered. And this fringe benefit is usually calculated on a monthly basis, 
And if you only have right of use for a part of the month, you would need to apportion that benefit for the portion or the part of the month that you had right of use. And if we look at this amount paid by the employee in terms of this calculation to calculate the value of the benefit, it excludes any amounts paid by the employee for things like maintenance, licensing, um, insurance, or fuel for that vehicle. Once you've calculated the value of private use, there are certain instances where you can actually reduce that for business purposes, or if the employee uses, uh, bears the full cost of fuel or maintenance, then you can actually reduce that to make your fringe benefits slightly lower. But that is based on certain um, formula and calculations, and I would recommend that your accountant assists you with getting that correct. Let's look at the value of private use. How does the Income Tax Act or the seventh schedule determine the value of private use? And once again, we're looking at two scenarios. Where the vehicle is owned by the employer, there's a calculation of either 3.5%, or 3.25% per month multiplied by the determined value of the motor vehicle. And where the vehicle is leased by the employer, it will be the actual cost incurred under the operating lease plus cost of fuel incurred on the same vehicle. So let's delve into those calculations a little bit deeper. When the vehicle is owned by the employee, you have a choice of percentages to use. And that choice is determined by whether that vehicle has a maintenance plan on it or not. If the vehicle is subject to maintenance plan and um, for of at least three years or a distance of 60,000 kilometers, whichever comes first, you can use the 3.25%, provided that that maintenance plan was actually brought out at the same time the motor vehicle was purchased. So it doesn't uh, uh, apply at all to any top up or add on plans. And once that maintenance plan has actually run its course and it's completed over, say, the three years, you don't have to revert back to the 3.5% your fringe benefit value stays at the 3.25%. Now, the determined value of the motor vehicle, if that vehicle um, has been purchased outright by the employee, it will be the cost to the employer, including any add-ons, like, for example, if you had to pay extra for a certain color or for certain mags or things like that, that would be included. So it's the cost price, but it excludes any interest or finance charges, as well as insurance products. Like, for example, if you have an insurance product on it, say, like those um, scratch or dent policies, that if something happens, you can um, go and get it fixed. That will not be included in the determined value. It will also include, and there's been a change in this recently, any input VAT that is borne by the employer. So if this is a motor vehicle where you had an input VAT denied, so the input VAT claim was denied, then you would have borne as an employer that input that charge. So then you would include it in your determined value uh, of the vehicle. But if you actually could claim that input that, then you wouldn't have borne that, that um, cost. And then you could actually exclude it. And if this vehicle is leased in terms of an installment sales agreement, so it's almost like a finance lease, um, it is usually the cash value of the vehicle, which is the determined value. And that's usually the cost of the vehicle to the financier to the amount of financing you would have taken out. Something also to remember is um, some instances, the company might acquire the vehicle, but they only give a right of use to that employee, say, a few years down the line. So for every completed, so full 12 months, between where the employer acquired the vehicle and where the employer receives right of use of that vehicle, you would reduce that determined value with 15%. On the reducing balance method. In other words, you take 15% of the original cost and then the next year you would take 15% of the reduced amount already. And that value is then going to be included for your determined value. For PAYE purposes, you would have to include this fringe benefit for tax, but it does give you some relief in that the right of use of motor vehicle fringe benefit only needs to be included at 80% on a monthly basis to calculate your PAYE. And if the employer is satisfied, and they have put it in italics just to emphasize it, in other words, the employer has actually gone to the logbooks of the employee, and he's, he's quite certain that at least 80% of that use of the motor vehicle is for business purposes, then you can actually reduce the amount of fringe benefit that you include on a monthly basis for PIYE to only 20%. But please be aware that in your annual tax return of the employee, you would still bring in the full fringe benefit at 100%, calculate the tax on that, and then any employee's tax that you pay over the month that you were in employment, you would then deduct it from your tax payable. So it's very important that this 
reduction of percentage of inclusion is only for purposes of your monthly PAYE calculation. In your annual tax return, it will still include the full benefit that you received. Certain other fringe benefits that we don't see that often, but are important to be aware of, are, for example, residential accommodation. So if you receive any re residential accommodation free of charge, or at a rental less than the value of that accommodation from your employer that would give rise to a fringe benefit. For example, um, I'm not sure if it's, if it's that common in terms of small businesses and our SME market, but if, for example, the company or CC owns a residential property and they make that available to the employees to go on holiday, then that would give rise to a fringe benefit. Or, for example, um, you might be um, an agricultural type uh, um, business and you give housing to your farm workers either for free or for a very low rent then you also need to look at the fringe benefit implications the value of that fringe benefit is usually determined through the use of a formula calculation um, there are certain exemptions as well but that calculation of the value could get very technical so please use your assistant uh, or your accountant for assistance to help you with that as well any subsidies paid in respect of debt will also give rise to fringe benefits, whether that is the capital or the interest that the employer pays on behalf of the employee. Any contributions that the employer makes to insurance policies or schemes on behalf of the employee will also give rise to fringe benefits. And that also applies even if the employer kind of makes a bulk or lump sum contribution to an insurance policy on behalf of all the employees and not only a specific employee. And then to determine um, what fringe benefit value to actually allocate to each employee, you would take that lump sum and divide it by the number of employees that you have or who are on that insurance policy. Employees' debt or release from obligation to pay debt, that is something that is also um, quite important to know about. If you as an employer pay an amount to a third party on behalf of that employee, for example, a mortgage payment, credit cards that you pay off, anything like that, um, clothing accounts. If you pay that on behalf of the employee and you're not expecting them to pay you back, that will give rise to a fringe benefit. Or if you waive any obligation for the employee to pay you back in terms of a staff loan or anything like that, it would also give rise to a fringe benefit. Another example sometimes that happens is if an employee changes employment, so they go from one company to another, and they had study debt that was still payable from the other company, and their new employer then pays that study debt off in terms of their new employment, then that would give rise to a fringe benefit. There are certain exemptions that apply, so please consult with your accountant when you have this in your business. Any contributions paid to a medical scheme for the benefit of the employee or their dependents, um, subject to certain requirements and exemptions, will also be fringe benefits. And any medical costs incurred by the employer on behalf of the employee, including dental costs, hospital costs, nursing services, or any medicines, that would also be an amount, uh, an amount that results in a fringe benefit, and it's usually the amount incurred by the employer. That deals with most of the tax implications in terms of fringe benefits. Let's go over to the VAT Act. Now, the VAT Act says that any fringe benefits granted are subject to a deemed output VAT that is payable by the employer. And this is something that we see a lot of business owners or accountants actually miss. And it's very important because that's one of the first things that SARS goes and looks for when they conduct an audit. Now, there are certain exemptions. In other words, fringe benefits will not give rise to deemed output VAT if they are, for example, for, for exempt supplies, zero rated supplies, if it's a supply of entertainment as defined by the VAT Act, or if the business makes exempt supplies. So it's in the course of making exempt supplies. If the business makes taxable as well as exempt supplies, then the fringe benefit value on which you would have calculated the VAT, that needs to be apportioned between the exempt and taxable supplies. So as you can see, just looking at that small portion, you need to make use of your, your accountant who is knowledgeable about the VAT Act to help you with this, because they need to give you some guidance as to what are exempt supplies, what are zero rated supplies, what would be entertainment, and whether there will be a VAT implication on that fringe benefit or not. For example, a loan that you grant to, in your, your, grant to your employee at no interest will give rise to a fringe benefit for tax purposes, but for VAT purposes, the granting of a loan is considered a financial service. And that will be exempt for VAT purposes, so you won't have deemed output VAT on that. How do we value 
the consideration to be able to calculate the VAT on that. Now, in general, it'll be the cash equivalent of the fringe benefit multiplied by the VAT fraction. The cash equivalent is usually the value that is calculated in terms of the Income Tax Act. So all the slides that we just looked at in terms of how to calculate that fringe benefit, it's usually that value. But just remember also that the VAT Act deems all transactions to be inclusive of VAT. So you need to keep your wits about, it, about you when you are maybe a VAT vendor and you can claim input um, a tax up front, but it's a fringe benefit and you need to claim, you need to calculate deemed output VAT on that as well. So once again, your accountant can help you with that because they will be knowledgeable and experienced in terms of that. For VAT purposes, if we then look at the right of use of motor vehicle, it's, it's a completely separate calculation. So here you have a choice of either 0.3% or 0.6% multiplied by the determined value for VAT purposes multiplied by the tax fraction, uh, sorry, the VAT fraction. Now for VAT purposes, VAT will always be excluded from this determined value. For income tax purposes, it is now included if you bought, you, um, the, the VAT was borne by the employer. So just remember for VAT, you would always exclude it from the determined value. The choice of whether you use 0.3% or 0.6% is dependent on whether there was an input VAT claim on that vehicle or not. So if it is a motor car as defined for the VAT Act, you would use the 0.3% because no input was claimed on it. But if you could claim the input VAT on it, it would be the 0.6 that you use. And you can reduce that right of use of motor vehicle by the lesser of cost or 85 Rand, where the employee has to actually maintain that vehicle. So there's a slight relief where the employee also actually bears the maintenance costs. Just remember also that this is a monthly rate that is calculated and therefore it needs to be multiplied by the number of months of right of use as well. As you can see from what we've discussed so far today in terms of, as well as the VAT implications on fringe benefit, but it can get quite technical and as I mentioned it is one of the first places that SARS going looks for compliance when they conduct an audit. I'd like to include today is to give you an awareness of certain mistakes or areas that business owners can improve or can, can look for that they can improve in their business so that when a SARS maybe does ask for a verification or an audit, they actually have these areas covered. Because what SARS actually does is they contact you, they ask either for a verification or audit, we'll look at the difference now. And if you have a few discrepancies, they look at a few things, like for example, um, the right of use of the motor vehicle, whether you put the deemed output VAT on that, you've actually submitted it, then they would actually go and flag and it could possibly lead to further audit. So from a VAT point of view, common things that we see that business owners need to improve on is first of all, the hiring of employees or consultants that have insufficient VAT law knowledge. So if you are starting at your base foundation, and you have an employee who is not really knowledgeable and they can't actually help you to make sure that you are compliant with regards to that. That is your first mistake. And that's the first level where you actually need to make sure that um, you are, you have someone who, who knows how to do the calculations and who is able to flag certain VAT elements. What we often see also is that the outward put VAT payable on any insurance claims received or the sale of assets is not taken into account. So if you receive an insurance claim, there's a deemed output VAT on that that you need to submit. And if you sell any company assets, whether it could be old furniture that you sell, so it's not necessarily in the course of your business, it's, it's ad hoc things that you sell, you still need to, uh, um, uh, sorry, you still need to account for VAT, output VAT on that sale. Because as a vendor, if you're a VAT vendor, you are deemed to put output VAT on anything that you sell. The reconciliation of accounting records to the VAT returns before submission, we often see that not being done. You always need to make sure that your accounting records match what you've declared in your VAT return and also match what matches what you, what you submit in your tax return. Because SARS often goes and looks at what turnover have you got in your business that you declare in your income tax return and what turnover have you declared in your VAT returns. And if there's a discrepancy between those, then it could flag SARS. Not accounting for output VAT on fringe benefits, which is what we discussed today, that often doesn't get done. The failure to obtain or retain valid tax invoices. So you might not actually have supporting documentation for any transactions or all your transactions. And if you have input tax claims, you need to make sure that your tax invoices that you received do comply with the requirements of the VAT Act in terms of the certain things that need to be on that invoice 
for you to be able to validly claim that input VAT. And in certain instances, if you fail to respond to a VAT verification request from SARS, then it could either just lead to them denying the claim at all, or they could actually flag it for an audit because you could, they could say, well, why is this person not actually, or why is this company or CC not actually coming back to us in terms of verification? What is it that they not, do not want to disclose or that they do not actually have support for to disclose? Remember also, um, just for you, those of you who are not familiar with the terms, Verification from SARS is usually just a request for additional information. So it's usually documents and um, invoices and things that you submit to SARS and they want to see whether the transactions that you have put in your VAT return are reasonable. Whereas a SARS audit is much more in-depth. It's usually an, in, uh, an on-site visit that they do. They um, hold interviews with employees, they check supporting documentation and all sorts of things like that. So it's a, a lot, it takes a lot of time and a lot of costs. And SARS will usually go and look at your cash book and your bank statement first. And they will go and look at certain transactions from the bank statements and question those. For example, if you made payments to places like, for example, Pick and Pay or Woolworths or Checkers, they'll go and question what were those for, um, who was it paid to, uh, uh, for, on behalf of whom was it paid, and things like that. So it's just something to be aware of with regards to supporting documentation as well. Then common mistakes in relation to payroll. Once again, the hiring of employees or consultants that have insufficient payroll and tax knowledge, it could be very detrimental to your business. Not including fringe benefits in the payroll system or in your PAYE calculations, as we've, as we've looked at today. Transferring assets or similar benefits in lieu of salaries or bonuses, in other words, salary structuring, where you want to actually save the employee employee's tax by not paying a cash bonus and thinking you can get away with it by giving assets or holidays or other things but then as we've seen today that would still be applicable in terms of fringe benefits there will be PAYE on it. Any payments to directors or members not attracting PAYE so not taking into account that directors or members are also employees of that company or CC. The incorrect use of income tax codes or non-issue of RP5 certificates to employees, especially if you are owner managed, you think you don't, you might not have to do that, but it is an obligation that is specifically put on you. And not accounting for travel or other allowances correctly. We often see that too. And one of the things that SARS will look at if they inspect your cash book or your bank statements are any payments that you make for fuel. And if those payments are made to employees, then it could actually give rise to a travel allowance. So it's important once again that you work very closely with your accountant for any verification or audit by SARS so that they can make sure that everything is in order, that when you submit support to SARS, that actually everything makes sense and you have accounted for everything correctly. From what we've discussed today, and in terms of the audits that might come up from SARS, you can see that a potential SARS tax audit could run into hundreds of thousands for professional fees, especially if it lands up in tax court, because then it might not just be your accountant that needs to assist you, but it, you might need to get a tax expert or a specialist or even a tax attorney to help you. And one of the strategies of SARS to increase their revenue collection is actually to increase the audits of the small, medium and micro entities. So you might think, oh, well, I'm so small, they might not even notice me. They won't audit me. They're actually targeting that market right now. Now, the solution that we've seen actually is quite that, that is quite quite effective lately is to take out inexpensive tax risk cover to make sure that your accountants and other tax specialist professional fees are insured. We have a very nice tool on the BAN website. I do recommend that you go in and log on to or, or visit our website. And then at the top, you'll see a banner services. On the left hand side, you'll see um, a column dealing with tax risk cover and there's a button to click on that says apply now and it takes you to a page which allows you to fill in certain information and get quote almost immediately tool because then you know you have peace of mind and you are covered in case this does happen to your business because in some businesses we've actually seen that this could be financially crippling i hope that from today's webinar it has given you a very good awareness and understanding of fringe benefits and that you feel comfortable that you, um, through this understanding, you can actually deal with some areas in your business that might still need some tax compliance. And we'd love for you to do the next client webinar. It's to be held on the 23rd of November at our usual time slot, 9 to 10. We haven't confirmed the topic yet, 
but please visit our website regularly to see when we put the topic up and you'll also receive an information uh, sorry an invitation um, as to what our next webinar will be if there are any questions please feel free to send them through thanks Shane questions that are coming through um, Imran, thank you for your question. I'm just going to read it out for those who might not see the screen. Imran asks, where I reimburse an employee for his travel costs incurred for business? Petrol filled, Uber fees, etc. Is this taxed and is there a deduction? Now, Imran, just from the very brief information that you've put in your question, it does sound like it might constitute a travel allowance. There are, however, certain requirements that you need to look at with regards to travel allowances versus fringe benefits. So I would suggest that your accountant gets involved. But if it is a travel allowance, then you would possibly um, have an avenue of deduction um, with regards to business use. But it will definitely depend on your specific circumstances and the requirements of the Tax Act. Then Chris, Chris asks, will a retirement gift, for example, painting, also be considered a fringe benefit? I think Chris, just based on that question, I would, not knowing any other information surrounding that, I would think, yes, it would most probably be. And on retirement, probably in his last, the, that employee's last um, salary payout, you would probably, most probably need to account for the fringe benefit in that. Um, Madeleine, can I just maybe perhaps add to um, Im Imran's uh, question with regards yes. to the reimbursement? Um, yes. Okay, when you reimburse travel costs um, that a, an employee has incurred um, for business, that would fall under reimbursements, which is um, tax free. But it does need to be shown on the RP5 certificate as a tax free reimbursement. So that would include things like Uber fees or petrol, et cetera. It would be better, it won't be petrol necessarily. So what, what the Reimbursement um, Act says is that you need the your employee, if they are using their own car for business purposes, they actually need to log the exact kilometers that they've traveled. And they also have to log the reason for their travel. And then the act does change from year to year. I think it's around about three rand 90 or three rand 60 per kilometer that can be paid uh, or reimbursed to the employee. Now, when this happens, you do need to have a form that the employee completes and you sign it off to ensure that this will be regarded as a tax free reimbursement for travel rather than. Um, a travel allowance, so to speak. So to fill up a car with petrol would definitely not be a tax-free reimbursement. That would certainly be a, a, an allowance, and that would be taxable. Um, and that would be taxable either at 8% or 20%. But then I would suggest you do speak to your accountant in that regard. And with regards to Chris, uh, will a retirement gift also be considered a fringe benefit? Well, a retirement gift is only tax-free if the employee has had unbroken service for 15 years and the gift cannot exceed 5,000 Rand. Anything that exceeds 5,000 Rand and the employee has had unbroken service for 15 years, anything over and above that will be deemed to be a fringe benefit. Um, over to you, Madeleine. Thanks, um, thanks Monique. Um, Chris asks, is there a deemed output VAT on employers' contribu contributions for, for income protection policies, or will this be considered financial services and exempt? Um, now, Chris, I must say I would actually refer you to the VAT Act in terms of the financial services definition. Offhand, I would like to do some research for you, but just considering the nature of insurance protection policies, I would think those might possibly constitute financial services, and in which case, if they do, they would be exempt from the deemed output VAT because an insurance policy is usually financial, uh, a financial service in nature. Um, I yes. know that doesn't answer your question as such, but you can always, we can always kind of take that offline and look at it in more detail. Yes, I think I would agree there definitely, Madeleine. Um, income protection policies is certainly a long-term insurance policy, which does fall under Section 2 of the VAT Act, um, and that is a financial service which would be exempt. Um, it's only short-term policies, where VAT is, um, where, where it's subject to VAT. And um, that would be, for instance, taking out a short-term policy on an employee's 
say, um, furnished and fittings at home as a fringe benefit, for example, then of course that's subject to VAT and there would be a VAT output or a VAT deemed output on a, on a short term policy. Over to you, Madeleine. Thanks, Monique. Um, are there any questions? Celeste asks Is a company fuel card a fringe benefit and how should they be treated for tax purposes? Well, Celeste, it really depends on how the employee uses that fuel card because a fringe benefit usually only rises if you get a benefit for your own private or domestic purposes if it's for business purposes then we need to actually look at it differently so then the fuel card if the company pays for it and it's used for business purposes it'll be a company or business cost but if it is to reimburse say in a way the employee or if the employee actually uses that card and they can actually use that fuel card for private purposes as well in other words their private um, use of that vehicle, then a fringe benefit might arise and you, you might actually have to go and look at when do they use it for business, when do they use it for private purposes, and then either go and see how you can split that out or even see whether it's incidental to the business or not. So I think it also depends very much on the use of that field card. Okay, if I may also add in um, as well, Celeste, is that usually um, SARS will regard um, a fuel card as being a travel allowance and taxable as a travel allowance. And this is what we have seen from recent payroll audits from SARS. So um, from that perspective, either 80% or 20% of that fuel amount should be taxed and, and well added onto remuneration and tax. So that's generally the take that we have seen recently. I hope that does answer your question. Over to you, Madeleine. Thanks, Monique. Um, Shane, are there any other questions? 